Welcome to flight video for flight four of the Hawking Lancer. Big thank you to our sponsors, Patreon supporters, as well as uh, Butler Parachute. Say congratulations, Hawking. <laughs> Welcome to the fourth flight video for the Hawking Super Lancer Fowler Flap Equipped Lancer 320. This is our fourth attempt to finish the flight card, that first flight flight card uh, for Hawking's Lancer. We had had problems up to this point. You can go back and watch the videos, but flights one, two, and three were plagued with cylinder uh, head temperature and oil temperature uh, overheating problems. So we decided to kind of clobber it uh, on this flight with uh, hitting it with the big guns. So not only did uh, Hawking install a new cowl flap, which we'll brief you on here in a second, uh, but he also um, uh, pushed the flight up. So we took off, uh, you know, basically we met there at uh, seven o'clock in the morning, did the, all the briefing stuff we needed to and took off almost immediately. So rather than a hundred degree air temps uh, after waiting for uh, Chase to fly up and the weather to break, yada, 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 uh, we we're dealing with like 55 degree uh, outside air temperatures. So uh, we hit it with the OAT, uh, we hit it with these new cow flaps and uh, the results are pretty awesome. I think you're going to enjoy it. In the meantime, I want to make sure that we take the time to thank our sponsors. A big thank you to uh, Butler Parachute. You guys make a fantastic parachute, and I feel honored to wear it. And a uh, big thank you to all of our uh, Patreon supporters. Really appreciate what you guys have done in allowing us to continue to tell these stories. Uh, you know, uh, There's so many great things happening in home-built aviation, and uh, I feel fortunate to be able to share at least a couple of them uh, with you guys. So thank you to the Patreon supporters that helped make that happen. Uh, here comes the video. You guys ready to start walking? Ezra, let's go! So we'll start off as we always do with the maintenance performed briefing from Hawking. Purpose of this briefing is to uh, make sure that even though we've been talking, you know, you know, once a week or maybe once a month, make sure that we sit down and talk about what we believe is everything that's happened to the airplane since we were last there. Just in case anybody forgot anything. This of course feeds back in the loop of what are the test points of the day, what are the limitations of the day, making sure that the limitations haven't been changed by a mod that's been done, making sure that we're properly opening the envelope of any of the mods that have been done, uh, and how all those things fit together to decide how we're gonna fly at the point of the day. So we try to do that first when we first get there. Um, you know, if I have any text messages from the customer, or emails from the customer, we'll pull those out and make sure that we're talking about all those, make sure we walk around and put our hands on the things that were changed uh, to make sure that we're properly prepared for the flight of the day. Main is performed. What have you done since we were last year? They um, changed the carburetor nozzle jet to the original one. Do you know the size? I know it's the richest one. Yeah, they don't spell out the size and uh, they don't even want to talk about it when you call them either. Uh, the other things, I uh, added the cow flares. Okay. And also the little... You call it a cow flare? I don't know what to call it. No, I like it. Yeah. Uh, and also the little piece here in front of the gear door. Just to and down there, I don't know if it's necessary, but I'm doing everything that I can to, uh, you know, to see if we can get more air out of the cowling, if that is the issue. And that goes all the way around uh, both side, uh, the full outlet loop. Well, it's obviously cut here oh, for nice. the gear, but uh, otherwise, it, 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 you know, as, as much as I can. And it's what, probably two inches? No, it's probably more than that. It's probably like three and a half. As far as the height? The height is probably like two and a half. So the cow flare uh, makes cooling better sort of in two ways. So uh, obviously uh, you sort of intuit that, that if the cooling inlet on the front of the engine is bigger, that means more cooling. If the cooling exit on the back of the uh, cowling is bigger, that means more cooling. If you go, uh, there's plenty of people to study this. I'm not going to rehash it, but there's there's ratios that people like to use between the front, uh, you know, between the inlet and the outlet. Uh, different people like different ones. It's different for 
pushers versus tractors, etc. Again, I'm not going to rehash it. So, but but basically, if you just make either one of them bigger, you're going to make uh, cooling better. You know, notionally, broad speaking, go Google it. You can learn a lot more. The other thing that the cow flare does. So not only does it make the the area bigger, right? Because we're sort of just expanding the amount of aft facing area. Also, because it's, it's sort of shaped like the front half of an airfoil. So if you sort of imagine airfoils is sort of a, a tighter radius on the front and then a flatter radius on the back, you sort of remove that back uh, radius, that front radius creates a low pressure area right behind it. So there's air coming along the bottom of the cowling and then and then it goes over that lip, it creates a bunch of low pressure there that helps draw air out of the cowling even more than just the uh, uh, aft facing area that you would have already gotten. Um, that's why you see that that sort of geometry on cow flaps and things like that. It's, it's a very common geometry on the, uh, specifically on uh, cooling exits on the bottom of, uh, of airplanes. And that's uh, fiberglass, obviously. Yeah. And it's uh, pop riveted and then um, aluminum tape on top of that. What resin did you use? West Uh And also I fixed all the, um, the voids in the laminate in the back here. Drill and fill, sand and uh, <laughs> micro and all that kind of stuff. And it was on both sides? Yeah, more on this than the other, but still. And uh, same thing west? Yes. Cool. So we had been uh, tracking this issue uh, since flight two on uh, on the Lancer. I didn't talk about it in the videos, I don't think, uh, but you can see it in the reports that are included in the descriptions of the videos. Uh, this is a section of uh, of skin above the flap. So uh, you know, you know, typically it'd be skin and then an open area and then bottom skin. In this case, it's just skin and then the lower surface is the flap. Uh, so it's sort of unsupported area uh, above the flap. And it's just a laminate and then a very thin section of core and then more laminate. We're seeing a void forming uh, between the core and that top laminate, just like a void. You could see it, you know, and changes in the contour of the paint. And then it was slowly growing over time. Uh, so before the flight, Hawken decided to uh, to do the drill and fill. So a drill and fill is a you know old composite technique. So I apologize for everybody that's done it before. But in case you haven't, you're just drilling holes through the laminate in order to so you have a, a way to inject resin in to hopefully reconnect the laminate to the core. It's not uh, obviously not as good as uh, removing the laminate and replacing it, uh, but allows you to keep moving, especially in a situation like this where we're just trying to get through to the uh, the, the flap testing so we can uh, move on with the rest of the program. Um, so on this, any indication of what was going on? On the bubbles or? Uh, yeah. It, it's just DLAM. Uh, and that's above your flap, right? So this is all the custom stuff that you did? Yes, exactly. So it, it's a it's, uh, core up to about here, I think. And then this solid laminate out yeah. here. So it's somewhere um, around here, the, the, the core didn't... What's the core? Which core are you using? Foam core, but I can't remember what foam that was. I think it's a PVC base. Okay. Oh, one more thing. I disconnected the uh, right. this foam, so that one moves a lot easier now and more direct, more slop. Cool. So eventually, I'm gonna hook that up, but I I want to redo the design a little bit to minimize the friction and stuff like that. So. On the way in, we talked about uh, whether or not there were wolves and bears <coughs> in Tashby Mountain Park. Gideon didn't think so, and then that bird just made that noise, and now he may be convinced. <coughs> Hawking Lancer 320. 
So for this pre-flight briefing, it was one of the first we've done in a while without Chase, uh, which uh, which really changes up the way the briefing goes. Uh, in a lot of ways, there's a lot less uh, like tactical information required uh, because you know it's not uh, you know when we're going to change frequencies and, and every single step has to sort of clearly be laid out so that uh, the two guys can stay together and know what the other one's going to do. But at the same time, um, there's much more of a disconnect uh, when you're airborne about what's going on. So you so you have to try to keep things as tactically uh, uh, informed as possible uh, without that need to stay tactical. So the best example is uh, Justin and I a long time ago were doing a program uh, where we were doing um, a lot of uh, load check uh, type work. So diving the airplane and putting a bunch of G's on the airplane, uh, speed and G stuff. Uh, on a on a race plane for a guy and it was all without chase. And so what would happen is uh, you'd sort of, you know, do the mod, whatever the change was, we'd uh, take off and one guy would be sitting on the radio and the other guy would be out flying. You know, climb up to altitude, takes a long time to climb up to altitude. In climbing altitude, you can you know, position yourself anywhere on the airport that you want. And then the, the, the uh, dive checks would start. And so there was a tendency to, uh, you know, okay, rolling into position, uh, 150 knots, 160 knots, yada, yada, 200 knots, okay, here comes the pull, 2 Gs, 3 Gs, 4 Gs, 5 Gs, and then hold. And so two things happen real immediately, right? So uh, if you call off the buildup to G, but don't call the point complete or uh, knocking it off or you know whatever, uh, then the person on the ground, they just don't hear anything. So they may think that you've had an emergency. Um, so making sure that the person on the ground understands when you, uh, you know, what you're gonna do and when you're gonna do it so that they know whether or not to call a fire truck, especially if you're depending on them for fire trucks. The other thing is to make sure that they know where you are, right? So uh, one thing we struggled with on this particular day uh, and something that we struggled with uh, on, on other programs in the past is um, making sure that you have a shorthand for where in the airport you're gonna be. And if there's a guy listening to the radio knows you know, which way's north, which way's south, what what um, what geographical landmarks you're going to use to say where you're at, right? So again, uh, just trying to prepare the ground crew uh, to be able to support if there is a, an accident or an incident. All right, so everybody's here. We're briefing uh, flight four uh, weather. I checked TFRs and NOTAMs, but I didn't check. Weather looks good. Uh, brief mission overview. So the plan is to take off, uh, climb in the uh, immediate glide cone of the airport uh, up to but not above the class delta, 3,800 feet, offset to the north. Uh, finish the climb up 7,500, do a cruise for 15 minutes, and then RTB. Um, we should compare ground speed to airspeed. Okay. Because I'm not During sure. During the cruise? Yeah at any point in time, I guess, because I'm not so sure that the indication of the airspeed is correct. Uh, so for maintenance and uh, ER status, uh, this is the new carb jet on our MA4 SPA, mm -hmm. which is the richest one that they sell. Yep. Uh, we added the new uh, cowling flare, uh, which is 2.5 inches tall. We did the drill and fill to both wings, mm -hmm. uh, and then we disconnected the outboard throttle. Did you think you made it? That's it. That's it. Yeah. Uh, weight and balance is the same as last time. We're still top from last time. Did you put more gas in? No, I didn't. Okay. Uh, so we'll just pull it out, and then I'll pull up to the hold short line. Mm -hmm. uh, call ground. Taxi down. Assume we're going to take off to the west. Um, after we get airborne, uh, we'll be watching the CHTs, which we'll go over the limits in a second. Mm -hmm. um, but it's going to be a 2,500 RPM climb at... Uh, 125 is what, what I used on the last one. Yeah. yeah, 125 here too. But no faster than 143 if we have to try to control CHTs up to that 3,800 feet. Right. Uh, and then I think once we get above traffic pattern, I have no problem pulling back on the black knob <coughs> to try to control CHTs. Right, right. Uh, but the goal would be full black knob, 2,500 RPM all the way up. Right. And if you have to go a little bit fast, faster than 125, we can do that too if you don't get enough cooling or whatever that is. I think, yeah, yeah. And so 143 was what I was going to use for a max for the day. Yeah, so. yeah. Okay. Um, chase procedures, no chase. Work areas, we talked about the, we're going to go north of the airspace. Yeah. But south of uh, the two ones we've talked about on every one of these, Blackington, Warner Springs. We haven't talked about that one. The other one was Palma, right? I don't see Palma. Oh, there it is, Palma. Palma, Blackington, and Warner Springs. So that's yeah. kind of my 
work area there. Yeah. Take off, climb at uh, climb 7,500 7, at 125, no faster than 143. Once we get uh, to altitude, we'll accelerate out to 143 and then do that cruise stuff. So the plan was, uh, that's the, the limitation. So we're going to try to do cruise stuff, but uh, not if it's above 143. So maybe the answer to the question would be, what power can I run and hold altitude at mm -hmm. 143? Mm -hmm. uh, you want that at 2,500 RPM? Yeah. Ground speed check in 2,500 RPM. So it'll just be black knob until it holds 143, yeah. and then we'll write that number down. Um, we, we plan to do a, a gear extension and simulated <coughs> go around. Um, I don't know that the simulated go around has value, but I think uh, doing actual handling check down to min speeds mm -hmm. uh, has value. So we'll uh, extend the gear at the gear speed of 100 knots. Gear speed's 122, right? Gear, yeah, 134. Uh, 122 is the uh, calibrated 134 indicator. Okay. So we'll uh, extend the gear 100 knots. Uh, do you think it makes sense to go out and hit uh, 134 to clear the doors to max speed? Or you want to skip that? No, yeah, let's skip that. Okay. So we'll extend the gear to 100 knots and we'll do handling checks on five knot centers down to 77. And then uh, simulate go around just as a way to get stood back up. But since we've sort of already done the slow stuff, I'm less worried about that. Yeah. Uh, and then it'll be uh, RTB back here for a flaps landing. 110 indicated mm -hmm. for approach speed. Right. Um, shut down, standard stuff just out here pointing. I guess we'll probably come back in here and point that way. Does that work for you? Yeah, uh, we'll we'll probably, probably come in here, here yeah. I think. Yeah. So we'll end up pointing that way. That yeah. for you. Transponder procedures, my plan was to squawk VFR for the whole day, so you can probably follow along on air or flight aware. That's right, and we can also check the um, well, we can't check it, but the... Uh, if it comes up on FlightAware with your tail, yeah. well, no, because Ramona might give it to him. The tower here might give, give the handoff to FlightAware, but give you a to spin Maybe they do, I don't know. So, anyway, it'll give you a chance to follow along with how the transponder right, right. So, mission limits. Uh, previously established 420 in the climb. Let's set degrees. up that so we don't limit ourselves here. Sure. Uh, let's do 440. 440. And for cruise, 420. Okay. Uh, oil temp, 215. Does that still mm -hmm. work? Okay. Uh, predicted VSO, um, 57 indicated with a uh, 52 calibrated. Mm -hmm. um, VS, 77, uh, based on the 70 knots predicted clean. Uh, rotation, at, uh, uh, rotation at 83. Uh, flap extension speed, 110. So. I don't know if you're comfortable with that. So you had a flap limitation speed of 100, and because right. of the air I'm pushing out to 110, do you think that's, the, is that what you want to do? No. It doesn't matter today, because I'm not swinging the flaps. But right, I don't want to go above 100. Even, just if it's an indication error. Okay, yeah. so we'll do 100. Okay. Uh, landing gear extension, so it was 122, same thing. Do you want to keep it at 122, or do you want to use the error to calculate at 134? What did you use last time? Uh, 122 is what we used previously. 134 is just putting in that error that we assume we have a 10% right. or whatever it is, 7%. Let's keep 122. Okay. Nope. Same side. I got it. And then same thing for VA. 143 was what we had used previously. Mm -hmm. The indication you want to... No, that's good. Okay. And then um, our new VNE with the error is 259. Yep. Okay. Uh, limit load factor, 3.8. Well, uh, no, we're not going to get over 2.5 today. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then uh, the, the limit for the flaps, it doesn't matter. Yeah. But there. Okay, so we talked about uh, limits. Uh, we don't have a parachute, so we're not going bail to do bailout stuff. Emergency procedures. Uh, we've talked about the gear, and I have the checklist. Uh, do you want to go through it again? Or I'm comfortable without, but if you want to go through it, we can. Emergency extension. Well, if you remember it, that's fine. Okay. You know, yeah, so. We're good there? Yeah. Any other go no go items that you can think of? No. I don't have anything. And then um, alternate missions. So I think the alternate missions thing is in the event that um, we have CHT issues, or probably in general, we just want to make sure, just like the last slide, that we try to get that cylinder number as well as CHT value as opposed to just a high number without the yes. cylinder. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. We should also keep an eye on the EGT because that's the mixture. The so for EGT, for uh, takeoff leaning versus Cruise leaning, do you have any, uh, do you want to try to knock that out, quantify that? So what I would say is, um, if it's like it was with the injection, yeah. uh, full power, and it's running rough, I'm going to lean until it's not running rough. Yes. 
and then we're going to climb and then once we get above get the gear sucked up then we'll do some fine tuning based on right. egt numbers since i'm not going to do a, a peak check during the initial climb right right i'm going to try to keep it in like 1250 at the richest right That'd be sort that of sounds if well, i was right. going to use egt yeah once we get up in a way and we figure out where actual peak is then we can have that conversation yep, yep. Uh, once we're in the cruise configuration though do you want to do a rich peak lean to peak thing you want to go find a peak and then try to get on the other side of the lean pot side of it do you want to just set it to say 1300 call it good for today 1300 is good i don't think we should go uh lean up peak because it's a carburetor i mean one that, one that's going to be lean one's going to be rich you know it's just going to okay yeah so just set it to 1300 for yeah, the course. yeah. Okay. wherever the engine runs well i mean that's usually the way i look at it you know Okay, cool. So that's my briefing. I think we went through the card. Is yep. There, uh, anything else from you? Yep, I'm good. All right. So at this point, barely off the ground, just turning crosswind, the CHTs were still well below uh, 400 degrees. So this was the first time on the program we had this, and I breathed a sigh of relief knowing that it was very likely we were gonna successfully complete the flight. So as mentioned in the brief, we did a cruise check at uh, VA, so well less than VH. Uh, recorded the power required to hold at VA, 143 knots. Noted the uh, ground speed in two different headings uh, during those passes so that we would have yet another uh, data point on the airspeed indicator uh, error. Then we threw the gear out and uh, started slowing the airplane down for handling checks uh, near stall speed, near approach speed, in a simulated go around. So the purpose of the simulated approach and then simulated go around uh, was uh, a little bit less since we had already flown uh, a couple landings in the airplane, but still it was a chance to slow the airplane down while not having to worry about flying an approach pattern or 
or deal with traffic or any of the other things that you have to do when you do that near the airport. As expected, uh, as the airplane slowed down, you lost effectiveness in all three axes. The most notable was that uh, the roll axis was the, the most decayed or the biggest concern, uh, which is important because um, if it was the elevator, uh, then, then it would be more likely we were gonna have a problem with the flaps. Obviously, there's gonna be a big pitching moment coming from the flaps, and so any elevator that's available um, is more uh, likelihood that we'll have enough power to overcome that. Uh, so the fact that the roll axis was the weakest is, is important. The other thing is uh, how weak is the roll axis, right? So if the roll axis is super weak, then you're not going to have enough roll power to keep the airplane in, uh, level and to maneuver the airplane to land once you're going even slower with the file flap, Fowler flaps uh, deployed. Uh, lastly was that the uh, the roll response became asymmetric as the speed came down so the airplane rolled a lot faster for a given stick deflection and uh, force uh, than did to the left than it did to the right. So with the uh, simulated go around complete we were done for the day so I sucked the gear up uh, for the flight back to the airport uh, for the landing. <laughs> Done, buddy? Yeah. No, you want to keep going, huh? Yeah. Yeah, you wish Daddy and Gideon were stronger. No, me. You're strong? Yeah. No, oh. I'm strong. No, I no. have the biggest story in the whole wide world. Congratulations. I was like, oh, it's probably nothing. And then, like, you're sitting there, and as soon as you go, don't have something to do, you're like, well, is it nothing? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, <clears throat> uh, pulled on the runway, or came out of the shock, it started fine, no problems. Uh, taxi down, uh, did the run up. The uh, uh, left mag uh, was a little rough. So, um, I had to do something. I don't know if you heard me down there saw it. Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. So, that's what I was doing there. So, that indicated to your point that it was rich. Yes. Um, so I pulled the uh, red knot back a little bit for the rest of the, you know, whatever, the 10 feet of taxi that I had. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I was uh, used to these long delays down there, so I was like, yes. oh, get the red knot back because we're going to be waiting for a while. Right, and I called right. him, he's like, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so leaned for the taxi, came back on the runway. It was full black knob, full blue knob, pump on for takeoff, 16 gallons per hour, uh, peak fuel flow, uh, gear up. Uh, power back to 2500 RPM and around and peak CHT was uh, yeah, 395 um, and then so that was cylinder number two cylinders three and four were both in the like 350 range uh -huh. and cylinder one never came above like 270 280 all day and there was like roughness that was kind of coming and going um, and once I got above the glide cone it was fine, but there was one moment right when we were waiting on the runway and kind of over there, just barely on the edge of the icon, like, man, does this suck? I don't know. But uh, once I got a little higher, it was not, I wasn't concerned about it. And of course, as soon as you're not concerned about it, you don't notice it. But there may be a little roughness, and I would say it's that cylinder number one. Let's do it with a new plug. Okay. Uh, you heard the transponders out. Yeah. Uh, so I did two reciprocal headings, uh, both at 143 indicated. Uh, 151 headings. Uh, 143 headings. So that's at 7,000. So I'm just going to do some true air speed calculation there. But it appears that there's not a huge uh, air speed indication there. But I need to run the machine. Right. Um, what power setting was that? Uh, so initially I was able to get it at 15, but there was a slight descent that I didn't catch. So I think it's probably like 17 inches. So it's 15 on the first. 18 on the second, and I think it's probably somewhere in the middle, probably closer to 18. So, so was that 60% power or something? I have to look it up, yeah. yeah. I, would, I would call it 17 inches at 2500. To what fuel flow did you get? Uh, that was like uh, 12, I think. That was 
full weight full right? Uh, so I lean to try to keep it below 1300, but it, it's like um, everything was, it was like this much range to go from uh, up in cruise, I could get like 11 EGT, 1100 EGT to 1300 was like that much. And then from there back was like 14, 15, like it happened really fast. So it was like really hard to get it right at 1350, which is what I was kind of shooting for. So there's more pitch force here than I thought. Uh, I left it trimmed at uh, whatever 100 and pull off of that trim speed, yeah. that 80. And yeah, I mean, it was, uh, I wouldn't have had any trouble measuring it. You know, it's not, it wasn't super close. Okay, that's good. So that's good. And I think that that gave me a chance to kind of tune my gains and I felt right. more comfortable uh, with everything on the way back down. Right. Um, there was uh, roll right, wasn't as powerful as roll left, it was a little bit weird, um, like sort of noticeable. Uh, plenty of dihedral effect as expected. Um, all that stuff. Didn't go any slower than 80. I could feel that I, you know, I wasn't far from the stall at that point, so knock it off. Really? Uh, so, so that's 80 indicated, but our predicted clean stall is 77. Right. With the air, uh, the 10% right. air. So, so we should be pretty close. So yeah. That all sort of jives. Yeah. Uh, I came back in um, again, just, just having finally got the chance to fly the airplane. My, especially the pitch axis. My gains were getting way better as the whole thing right, happened. Right, right. Right. I came in, in my opinion, I was a little bit low, but it's hard, you know, just not a lot of drag on the airplane, so I excused myself for that. Uh, I did not PIO in the landing that I could tell. I, mean, I couldn't yeah, see. But it felt much more like that's the ground, right. which is good. It did skip, I don't know if you saw it, touched and then got everyone again, but yeah. it, wasn't, yeah. it wasn't a PIO in the flare, which right. is what I've been doing. Right. So from my perspective, I don't see any squawks that down the airplane right now. Um, you know, the class deltas seems to be comfortable with us operating off the primary. Yeah. Uh, we're here, it's relatively early in the day, yeah. so the idea of putting together a cart for a second flight, I don't think is silly. I no, want to talk sure. about what it should be. Yeah. Right, so thanks for uh, coming along for flight four of the, uh, the Hawk and Lance here. We actually did two flights that day, uh, flight four and flight five. Uh, so uh, stay tuned, we'll be releasing Can the flight five video soon. Side. I think the cram was broken down. And a big congratulations oh, to Hawken oh, on a successful oh, oh. first flight. Oh, okay. Did you have fun in the forest? No, dad, dad. Yeah, but did no. you have fun in the forest? Dad, dad, chick. Truck. Whoa! 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 It's deep down there. It makes it walk slowly. Don't want to make a bad sound. No.